Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, if, uh, there are a lot of new faces in the crowd, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mary Beth Grego, the Arlene and Harold Spencer Curator of Asian Art at the Portland Art Museum. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our guest speaker this evening, um, Dr. Robert Delbonta, and I met in graduate school so long ago that neither of us can remember. <laughs> um, but at the University of Michigan, um, we sat near each other in Virginia Kane's class on Buddhist art. Um, he just raised his eyebrows. They're funny stories that I won't share either. So. <laughs> but anyway, um, Bob has been devoted to Indian art and culture for most of his life. He uh, majored in Indian art history as an undergraduate at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, working with Joanna Williams, um, a brilliant young scholar in the field, um, and he became interested in Indian sculpture, and she recommended that he do his graduate work at the University of Michigan with Walter Spink, um, best known probably for his work, most of which remains unpublished, on the great cave temples at uh, Ajanta. But in any case, um, Bob's work, his dissertation, was on the marvelous sculptures that adorn the temples of the Hoysala dynasty, which ruled the sort of southwestern part of India in the medieval period. And these are sculptures, they're carved out of a uh, gray rock that can hold over centuries, very, very detailed carving, and they're dripping with jewelry, <laughs> just dripping with jewelry. Um, they're just the envy of everybody who, who looks at them. It's a very, very distinctive style. And what Bob's research showed by spending um, many, many years or months in the field going around to places of the temples, which is not easy to do because many of them are out away from tourist sites. Uh, I think they even didn't have paved roads and so forth. It um, was figured out that part of the similarity in style in the Hoysala temples can be accounted for um, by, he noticed that the sculptures are signed. Here we have people signing their work um, in the 10th and 11th century, that there were itinerant teams of sculptors that traveled from one site to another. So this was absolutely groundbreaking and important research. Um, so then um, after he got his PhD, um, he came back to San Francisco, where his father managed a very elite jewelry shop that um, did work for Gumps and other high-end places. And he had perfectly good living working in his father's jewelry shop. So he chose to live as an independent scholar, um, leading tours to India, um, curating exhibitions, teaching. So in the early years when I um, was teaching across the bay in Berkeley, um, Bob was teaching the docents at the Asian Art Museum, curating exhibitions for them. Um, and he was also then already, I think, writing opera critiques. Um, and he got me, he trained me to um, go to San Francisco Opera and pay $5 for a standing room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, my legs were younger then. Um, but in any case, um, as an independent scholar, he's absolutely carved out several areas of expertise that are quite unique in North America. He's probably published more than any other North American scholar on the art of the giants. Uh, that's a uh, um, minority, I guess you could say, a religious religion in India, prominent particularly in uh, the western half, um, uh, Gujarat and in Kerala, am I right? And, um, well, he okay. was the first, I think, to uh, look a great deal at work produced in the context of the patronage of the Sikhs, uh, organized a major exhibition on uh, their work at the, San, at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco in the 80s. Um, and uh, he's also looked at modern calendar prints. Uh, and one of the most, I think, lasting legacies that he has, over a number of years, donated to the archives of the Sackler, which is the National Museum of Asian Art, Freer Sackler in Washington, D.C., his personal collection of European engravings of India. Um, from the 17th century onward. And what is, we did a little exhibition of these at the University of Michigan when I was curator there. And what is so wonderful about these engravings is seeing how screwed up the Europeans were. 
was so confused. <laughs> they were so confused. So you would sort of have uh, an Indian deity in a Japanese temple and a Japanese deity in a Chinese temple. They, you know, they, was, all those names were really hard for them to pronounce. It, you know. But um, the uh, the prayer and this, the sapper curators have done wonderful work with. Um, taking all of the interpretation and Bob's research over the decades and created this into a very rich and inspiring um, website. Um, he has an exhibition opening at the Berkeley Museum of Art, which their new building is now just one block away from the BART in Berkeley this June. Um, and he is, if you haven't figured out already from our website, he is the guest curator for the Indian painting exhibition within an exhibition uh, of Quest for Beauty, um, John Milan Collects. Um, so he worked with me from the very beginning. He's, he had a chance to see these paintings several years ago and then we visited them on this occasion. Um, and so now without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paul to talk about these paintings. So I'll decide to only talk about the show and not sort of try to uh, talk about all of these other things I'm supposed to be <laughs> doing. <clears throat> now the one thing that, that I want people to take away from this show is, is um, just first of all the quality of the works. Um, I think that for people who haven't looked at Indian painting in, in the past, sometimes it's a little difficult to comprehend. At least the show doesn't have a lot of iconography to worry about. Um, well, I mean, you might think there's a lot there, but there's a lot more that isn't in the show. Um, but the one thing that, that I, I always encourage people to, to look at, at, at Indian painting just like they look at modern art, and certainly don't look at it as, as if you're looking at Renaissance painting or you know, French academic style painting. Um, the thing that, that is, is most striking, I think, when you first approach Indian painting is the color. Um, but when you get into it and when you really start looking at it, you'll discover that it's really the line that carries the painting. Um, and um, and th thankfully there is the ex uh, three examples from the Jain tradition in the show, three folios from a, a Kalakachari Kata, uh, which sort of sets up the, the early styles that we lead into uh, later styles. And in those works, definitely the, the line is the first thing that you'll see. Um, and we'll be seeing them in just a little bit. But what I want to do uh, tonight is, is just to, sh to not, uh, to, is to show the paintings that are in the exhibit. I'm only showing a few other examples, mostly from uh, other collections of, of examples of, of from the same sets of paintings. Um, uh, John Yon was able to, or not able to, he collected earlier than virtually anyone else in this country. There were a few, there were a number of collectors, and specifically there were a number of collectors on the West Coast. Um, and they were all buying from a dealer in San Francisco uh, named Ray Lewis. And it won, there is actually a small little catalog that was done of Indian painting from West Coast collections that included some of, of John Yon's uh, examples and a number of, I was surprised at how many other names were involved in this show. Uh, most of these collectors obviously have passed on um, and many of the paintings are familiar to me because they're now in modern, sort of more modern collections. Oh, this way. So I'm starting out with the earliest examples uh, in, in, the, in the, uh, the show. These are three pages. They're from a, a manuscript called the, the Kalakacharya Kata. Kalakacharya Charya means monk. His name was Kalaka. And I won't go into this, this fully into the stories um, here, but we'll, I'll be showing you examples of other uh, paintings from other manuscripts and to show that this is, this is a very consistent um, uh, they're consistent compositions that are used for, for at least, well, a couple of hundred years in, in Gujarat. And these manuscripts were produced at a, on a very large scale. Uh, the Jains <coughs> um, really revere the, the written word and, and many devotees, laymen, would, would commission these works as gifts to temple libraries. And so the libraries have, have kept these things in pretty pristine condition. 
uh, for a long time. And little by little, some of these things come out of libraries. And this, of course, was coming out in the late 50s. Um, the story starts out with uh, Kalaka here on the bottom uh, riding a horse out to a, a uh, Gunakara, was a, a name of a monk. He becomes so enamored with it, he becomes a monk. And so what we have the, the, uh, is on the right, this is actually a, a painting from a, a, um, a manuscript that's now in, in Kansas City in the Nelson Atkins Museum. And you can see the compositions are, are very, very similar. Uh, the, the second painting in the series of three has to do with Kalika going out to meet what we call the Sahi King. He was a, some sort of a Islamic ruler to the West. Uh, we believe these are actually, the, the dynasty was called the Shakas, but it's called Sahi in these texts. Um, he goes out to, to, uh, to this king because he wants to say to his sister, his sister has been abducted by this evil king in India. Uh, that, there's a, a, a composition that's very popular of that, but it's not in this group. But I've, what I'm showing you here is actually, this is the, the, uh, the painting that's uh, exhibited in the gallery, but actually if you were able to turn, flip the folio over, there's another painting of, of, of e <coughs> Kalaka meeting with, with the Sahi king. What's interesting is that there's, always, there's almost always these two paintings, and one will have the Sahi King, uh, the one on the top, uh, dressed in much more of an Indian fashion, whereas the, the second one will have him in three-quarter view, which is the only three-quarter views in these, in these manuscripts, um, and, and dressed more in, in Persian style, or Islamic style. And here, again, from Kansas City, you can see the compositions can be fairly, fairly similar. But the manuscript that this, the Yan paintings are from is, is by far a, a much higher quality artist. What's the time frame? These are around 1450. Now, <clears throat> an important scholar, much more important in Jane Art than I am, uh, Saryu Doshi, has written a very important article years ago, uh, actually finding that many of the of this stylistic conventions used in these early Jain paintings are actually based on Mamluk uh, painting from, from Egypt. And here with this uh, painting on the right was actually done in the 12th century. And I think you can at least make out that the, the three-quarter face is, is something that, that they're borrowing. But there's a lot of other motifs and uh, floating elements that are, you find in Mamluk art you know, well before you find it in, in the Jain uh, traditions. Now you might think, oh, well, this is strange. I mean, how, why are they looking at Islamic art? Well, the point is that while this is being done, Gujarat is actually under the control of an Islamic dynasty. And this is, you know, long before the Mughals are arriving. And so there's a whole series of, of uh, Islamic influence in, in Indian painting from very early on. And the last scene is actually when the, the Sahi army then goes and <coughs> and uh, manages to conquer the, this evil king. And the evil king has an, a, a she-ass, uh, that's the blue figure in the left painting from the, the Yan painting, and the Kansas City one has sort of stripes. And the she-ass, when it brays, it will kill everyone. It's this terrible sound. And so what Kalika says is he gets all the archers to shoot arrows at, his, at her mouth the minute she opens her mouth, and which they do so she can't bray. She dies, and she defecates all over this poor, this poor king. And, um, but ultimately, the king is you know, expecting to be killed. But Kalika, of course, is a good Jane. They're not into, uh, into hinsa. They're not into violence. Uh, he uh, lets him uh, repent. Now, the, this first section in the gallery has to do with religious painting, although religious figures, specifically Krishna, shows up in virtually every, every aspect of the show. Um, and there are various aspects of the, of the, the god Vishnu. Uh, the painting on the left is in the show. The painting on the right is, um, no, I'm trying to remember it. It's probably in San Diego. Is from the same series, and it's a very large series because the title of, this, of, of it actually has to do with a thousand 
well, it says a thousand names, but the, there's actually a thousand and eight names within this whole series. And so they're all different aspects of the god Vishnu. Now, we, we all know Krishna, and some of us know Rama, and recently there was a big Rama exhibit in San Francisco. Um, but there are many, many different forms of, of Vishnu, and he's incarnations and various other, other aspects. And here we have him obviously being associated with the sun, because we see a, a, a Vishnu image in that gold, you know, radiated thing. We also see Vishnu at the bottom and Vishnu uh, at the top. And on the right, again, there's multiple Vishnus. Oops. <clears throat> Now, the other painting that, that in the show that has to do with Vishnu is Vishnu is when he saves the, the elephant king. Um, the elephant king has been caught by this terrible alligator type uh, makara. Uh, this, and the elephant king is very devoted to the god Vishnu, and he calls out his name. <clears throat> and so Vishnu comes down on his mount Garuda. Garuda is the bird at the, very, it's at the top. And the, he's a sort of a human and bird sort of combination. And what's interesting is that the artist is actually, he knows the story very well because normally you see Vishnu riding on that bird. But in this instance, he, the story very specifically says he's so eager to go save the elephant that he, he gets ahead of the bird. So he's basically flying on his own. And there he is. He's, this little circular, circular thing at the top is a discus that he's throwing, which is then you can see it, it going all the way down the painting, and then it's severing the head of the, of the demon and releasing the, the elephant. And one of his wives is there to, um, to praise uh, Vishnu as well. And there's a goddess that comes down in one of her celestial vehicles. And there's these, uh, another devotee and, and a, an ascetic who actually he has his, um, <clears throat> as a penance, he has his hands up forever, basically, and they atrophy, and people will have to feed these, these um, hermit-type ascetics. But um, there's some wonderful stories that have to do with these characters. I, it's not something I would want to do, but... Now, there are lots of... There, we do find lots of paintings of this scene. It's a very popular scene. The, the uh, painting on the right is actually in the Berkeley art exhibit that's opening at the end of, of June. And you can see the artists can play with, with the same elements in many different ways. The, the painting on the right is much earlier. It's from a, a another, it's sort of a central Indian um, <clears throat> area. Whoops, I'm, my fingers are too. Uh, and it's obviously less elegant, and I think you, you're more aware of the line in this, in this early painting. But, um, and the conventions in the, in the painting and the show are far more realistic, but this is because at, by this point in Rajasthan, uh, influences from, from Mughal painting, which has a lot of, of Western influence in it, has already you know, shifted through much of, of North India. <clears throat> and just a, just a, a third example uh, is, this one is in San Diego, um, and it's in the same style as, as this, uh, the painting on the left. And you can see that, that very often the one thing that Indian artists do that, um, that sometimes is sort of criticized is that what they do is they borrow elements from other paintings. And, that, and you might think of it as sort of a pastiche because they, they're taking the, I mean, the, obviously the elephant head part is basically the same. These are both done in, in the same center in Bundi. Um, <clears throat> roughly at the same time, and the character, the Vishnu figure, it also is, is very similar in his pose. And, but they, they'll take these elements and move them around and, and, and play, with the, um, <clears throat> play with the composition and, and in various ways. The nice thing in, the, in San Diego painting is that his, the, el the white elephant's wives are all black, or normal color elephants. Now, one of, the, one of the biggest paintings in the show, one of the biggest paintings in the show, is actually a, a very rare scene, and it has to do with the, the god uh, Krishna, and there'll be lots of Krishnas, we'll be seeing Krishna all night, it seems. Um, and this is uh, the earliest painting in, in the story of Krishna that is in, in the show. Um, it, it has to do with, with uh, Krishna's mother and father are actually in that little 
area on the rug, the mother is facing her, her cousin, who is an evil king. <clears throat> and then uh, the mother's, the husband, the father of Krishna, is, uh, stand, is behind that evil king. And it, it seems like a very calm little affair, but and in this style, it, in the 18th century, in the hills, there's is a very sort of elegant, almost romantic touch to most of the paintings. But the story is actually not really all that wonderful. Um, Kamsa, the, the cousin, has actually killed a series of eight children that were born to Devaki. And he's done that because he was told when she married that her, the eighth, her eighth son would kill him. But he didn't, he was more of this, like the, the, the slaughter of the innocents. He was <clears throat> much more, uh, he was just concerned about all of them. So uh, one after the other he killed. Um, one got away um, because they, he did, didn't quite know that the baby had been born. And that's Balaram. But, um, but when Krishna was born, he was squirreled away by his father um, and taken to a village of cow herders, which is important to all of the Krishna, Krishna legend, um, and then took the newborn baby girl back to the, uh, the prison where they were, they were, obviously it's a very nice prison, um, and it left the baby girl at Devaki's side. But Kamsa was so incensed with everything that he actually took the baby girl and threw it to the ground, but it turned out to be a goddess. And as she then rose into heaven, she just said, you know, you've had it, bud. You know, the, uh, Krishna has been born, and he will, he will ultimately kill you. There's another painting. Uh, it's the only other painting I've ever seen of this scene uh, is one that was recently sold by an English uh, dealer in London. Uh, and again, it's from the same, <clears throat> done in the same style, a rather to my mind, a rather effete style. I'm not the biggest fan of, of pretty art. I prefer it a little rougher and tougher. Um, but if you were able to, to look at details, we'll be seeing details of the one at the top that's in the show. Um, the artist of, of the, the Jan painting is by far the, the better of the two. Here you can see the detail of the uh, Devaki and her, her husband and, and her, her cousin. Uh, Kamsa, and you can see how elegant the, the style really is. Now, when, when Krishna then grows up with the cow herders, he's a little cowherd boy. And so that's what we see here on the left. And, and, and initially, your, uh, one's take is that, oh, this is Krishna and his brother, his brother Balram, who's also an incarnation of Vishnu, uh, are the blue Krishna. And Krishna means dark one, so he's depicted as blue and Balram is considered white. And the, the theory is that uh, Vishnu had a black hair, you know, a dark hair and a light hair that sort of gave rise to these two children. And so they're out, uh, you know, tending the calves as children. And um, the thing is that it, this is actually a part of a series of, of paintings that have to do with a very specific Vishnu, uh, Krishna image uh, from the site of Natwara, which is in Rajasthan. It's fairly close to, to Udaipur and you know, all the sites you may have gone to if you've been to India. Um, and what, uh, the temple there houses an image uh, that is self-manifest. It's an image that's believed to have a stone image that is believed to have been created by Vishnu, not by man. <clears throat> and it was discovered by a, 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 a saint, a Vaishnava saint, a, a follower of Vishnu. <clears throat> and established in this temple. And uh, daily there are eight darshans uh, that happen. There's rites that are, religious rites that are done. Darshan actually means sort of meeting. And, um, and this is, I guess, what the third, which is when Krishna is then, he is sort of uh, made into a cow herder. And so he goes out to, to, um, to uh, um, tend the cows, uh, the calves. And so on the, on the, right, at the top is, is actually this from a series that has to do with all of these darshans, and they combine a whole series of them. The, the, the image is awoken in the morning, and then it's fed, and he goes out to 
uh, with the cattle. He then comes back with the cattle. He's then fed again, and, or takes a nap, fed again, then put to sleep, and the cycle then restarts the next day. Now, when the, he's out with the cattle, he's, you consider him younger. Uh, as he gets a little older, he, you see him here in a cave uh, with some of the little cowherd boys. And uh, the story is that there was a terrible storm, and, and there's, they've, uh, they're hiding out from the storm in this cave. But what's beautiful is that he actually, he's in the cave here in the bottom, uh, and he brings his little, his little calf friends with him. And, and the calves are almost like people. They're, it's, it's quite wonderful. I brought this in just to, to show uh, different uh, Krishnas. We, uh, we've seen the, the, top, the top two and the one on the bottom. We'll be seeing the other one in just a little bit. Uh, just to show you how, first of all, how popular the, the image of, of Krishna is, and also to give you some sense that when you first look at these, you might think that Indian paintings, because of the way the colors are used, are, all look alike. But I think when you see all the faces side by side, you realize that there, there's, there's many stylistic differences. You also have to realize that, that in, in the instance of the fellow in the cave and the, all of the others, that these heads are only this big. Um, and so that, the, you know, one sometimes, I mean, some people think of Indian painting as looking rather crude, but I mean, uh, something crude can't blow up like this and still look, you know, like a, a real human face. And just the, the way the shading is handled, and uh, it's just, especially the little Krishna with the cows, it's really quite wonderful. <clears throat> now, these are, uh, we've gone back in time a little bit. These are from around, what, 1635, something like that. Um, and it's from a very distinct style from, from the art of Mewar from Udaipur. Again, if people have been to India and you've been to Rajasthan, everybody's been to Udaipur. That's where the lake palace is, and, which is a nice place to stay, but you're stuck out there. You know, you need a boat, so. Uh, there's a better palace hotel on the side of the lake <laughs> to stay at. <laughs> now these are illustrations from a, a text called the Rasaka Priya. It was actually written in the 12th century uh, by Keshav Das. And um, there's, we find many sets of, of paintings that have to do with this. It's, it's, a, it's a very long set of poems. Um, and you, they're, it was very popular throughout North India. You find them in, in all sorts of different styles. Um, and many of the poems have to do, uh, they all, uh, virtually all have to do with Krishna. And many of them have to do with his love for his, uh, one of these cowgirls, uh, Gopi, called Radha. And what's interesting is that, that specifically in North India, uh, there's a movement we f refer to as bhakti. Bhakti means faith, where um, one's devotion to Krishna becomes a very personal one. Um, and very often, even if you're a male poet, you, you put yourself into the guise of Radha, his, his favorite. And uh, some of the poetry becomes actually quite erotic, or most, much of it is quasi-erotic. Uh, in the case of the poetry of the figures, on uh, the one on the left, the poem actually has to do with their lovemaking, and it's, apparently it's supposed to be as wild as it can get. And um, uh, I don't know why they have a little handmaid in there. To, uh, she's, um, and she's probably there because it's getting very hot, because what she's holding is, is called a morchel. It's a, a fly whisk that's made out of peacock feathers. So perhaps she's sort of trying to calm them down. The, the, the poem on the right is actually a, a little bit more interesting, but again has a sort of an erotic ending to it. It has to do with the fact that Radha and her, her, her gopi, her, her women cowgirl friends, have gone to one side of the, of the river, and you can see they've taken their saris off. They're all sort of lying on the ground. And they're bathing in the river, and Krishna and his pals have gone on the other side of the river. And, um, and they sort of, they're all separate, but then the poem says that Krishna and Radha then meet in the center of the river, and then they dart out to get away from, from all of the other people, and presumably to do bad things. 
And again, uh, details are really important. Uh, again, these are little, tiny little details. And if you can bring a magnifying glass to an Indian painting show, it, it helps tremendously. Um, because, again, uh, you're going to first look at this, these wonderful colors. I mean, these oranges and blues and stuff just pop out at you. But then when you look at the details, you realize, you know, how line, I mean, just look at the convention for water. It's just, it, it's spectacular. And these fish, you know, you really have to look at the fish. I mean, they seem to have little ears. I mean, they're really great fish. <laughs> Now, the one we've just seen, the one on the left, actually the Jan collection has a third from this set. Now, this set is very highly prized now. I mean, when he was buying in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, these, these paintings were around. But it's very rare to see them come on the market now. And he, he would probably be quite surprised at how expensive they, they now are. And there, as it's, again, it's a large set. This is a, a painting that's in Chicago or Los Angeles now, I can't remember which. Um, and then there's another uh, painting here, I think it's in San Francisco, the one on the right. So I'm just comparing them to the two in the show. <clears throat> now another important text that has to do with, with this bhakti movement of this relation between Krishna and, and Radha um, is the, the Geet Govind. And the Geet, uh, Geet means song, Govind is actually the cowherd, so it's the song of the cowherd. Um, and so wonderful, if you ever get a chance, there's a, a Barbara Stoller Miller did a fabulous translation of the Geet Govind uh, many, uh, probably 35 years or 40 years ago, well she died I think 35 years ago. Um, and in this story it's, it's really interesting, He's He's actually taking musk and he's, and he's putting a little dot on her forehead. Now, if you've ever been to India and you've gone to a temple, priests have put dots on your forehead. Um, it's, when you go to a temple, you bring prasad, you bring a gift to the gods, and you, get, you usually get a gift back and you get this uh, little mark on your, your forehead. And one of the conventions here that is something you'll see throughout uh, a lot of this, this Krishna and Radha paintings and love paintings is they'll, you'll see here there's a pair of birds and the pair of birds are also they're a reference to the fact that they're a couple um, and here they're in this forest glade you know in this blanket of lotuses um, this is from a very distinct style from uh, central India from Aurangabad um, from around 1650 it's a little earlier than much of the paintings in the show Again, there's this one's in Chicago. Uh, and this, I, no, that one is probably in the Binney collection in San Diego. This one's in Chicago. Uh, so the, the text is not exclusively about Radha and Krishna. Uh, it's about various other aspects of, of Vishnu. So we've already seen Vishnu <coughs> saving the elephant. Here there's um, and then Krishna and Balram are two of his incarnations, and there are ten important incarnations. And these are another two. Uh, the one on the left at the bottom is his dwarf incarnation, Vamana. Um, and what it is is that this king says, you can have as much land as you can cover in three steps. So, you know, so he fooled him. The first step that was the world, the second step was, you know, that much more, and then the whole universe. And the figure on the right is a, a character named Par Parashuram. He's the Ram that carries the Parasha, the, uh, the, the axe. He's killing a demon. Uh, most of the incarnations are busy killing demons. Now the other, the third important and popular text that's, in, that's represented in the show <coughs> is the Bihari Satsai. And Bihari Lal uh, wrote the Satsai. Satsai means a hundred. Um, uh, I mean, 700, uh, and there are actually more than 700 verses in the satsai. Now, the satsai, what's interesting about the satsai is that very little of it is specifically about Krishna and Radha, uh, or about Krishna at all, but virtually all of the paintings, uh, the love theme paintings anyway, in the series, um, in this particular series from 1719, uh, represents Krishna and Radha. So it's, it's sort of like the bhakti movement has, has sort of co-opted lots of this, this love poetry that was being written. 
<clears throat> so in the one uh, instance on the left, um, Radha is, is telling Krishna off. Um, and you see them three times. Um, and she, what she's telling him is that, you know, you just can't keep your hands off women. And, uh, and you blame it on your, ultimately, and the, the poem ends with, and you blame it on your eyes. And so she's obviously pretty annoyed. Um, on, the, on the right, it actually has to do uh, with a, um, a, a man that's been traveling, and he discovers that his wife is, is uh, really missing him. And here you see, it's a fairly common uh, sort of conceit to have a woman or a man on a couch sort of lounging there. And, you know, they're just swooning and moaning, bemoaning the fact that they're absent lover. There's a, Indian poetry is, you'll have the erotic side, you'll also have this love in, in combination, but you'll also have love in division. I mean, the point is that much of the poetry has to do with, um, with women or men alone and, and uh, pining for, for their lover. Again, it's a, with 700 of them, obviously there's, um, or 700 more, uh, they're all over the place. Um, this one is in San Francisco. Uh, this one is in San Diego. So again, the West Coast is represented a lot by Indian painting. Now these are, are faces from both of the paintings from the Yon collection. And the thing is that, you know, when you start looking at them, even if you look at 200 of the, I don't think I've seen quite 200, but I've probably seen close to 200 from this set, you would think that, oh, they sort of, they were all done by the same artist. Well, obviously they weren't. And so you can see that the, the, the face on the one uh, painting, this is the one uh, <clears throat> at the top and the bottom is, is from uh, when she's telling him off. And the, uh, the one on the right, obviously it's a very different artist. It's a fully different, different face. And again, these are things you only can see if you really look carefully. But again, they're just postage stamp size, size faces. <clears throat> and just again, uh, uh, just to bring some of the ladies in, uh, we've seen, uh, we haven't seen the one on the right yet, but we'll be seeing her. Again, you might, your impression, I think your first impression, especially since the women are dressed so similarly, you just, you think that it's, you know, sort of like a cookie cutter approach to to these, uh, you know, the physiognomy of these ladies. And, and presumably, much of this has to do with looking at people. And uh, I mean, even in, in Indian art, I was surprised when I was working with, with Hoysala sculpture that um, all of a sudden I was in one of these little villages where you, know, you had to walk a couple of leagues just to get there. Um, and I looked around, because the whole village stops work when they see some guy show up. And I looked around and I realized that these people looked exactly like the sculpture. <laughs> and I also realized that they were only this tall. And, and this temple, especially the one temple that's only 33 feet tall, people say, oh, it's so little. Well, if you're looking at it from down here, it's, it's a lot bigger. And, but uh, anyway, so, and you will find people with these little sort of double chins and stuff with poor little Rada at the bottom. And I just brought in one, again, to some details from different paintings just to show the different conventions that are used for, for, uh, do, for making trees. Uh, <clears throat> the early convention is seen at the top right, uh, top left and the, and the middle, which are basically, we call them thick blob trees because it's basically a stick-like trunk, trunk, not trump. Uh, and, and then you actually paint the, fill in the color of the tree and then put leaves against it. Uh, whereas uh, in, in most of the later styles, things are, are much more naturalistic, the way the branches will work in the trees. But it's still uh, very much the same sort of approach to the way these flat colors are sort of uh, juxtaposed against each other in these wonderful shapes. Now, one group of paintings in the show have to do with Ragmala painting. Uh, Ragmalas are, it, mala means uh, rosary, or whatever, what do we call it? Garland. Um, <clears throat> I mean, rosaries are called malas too. But anyway, and raga is a, it's a musical mode. It's, uh, the way uh, ragas work is, it, it, they're not written melodies. They, they, they tend to be 
like a series of notes that have to be used, or there might be the absence of certain notes, and then the artists, the, the musicians will improvise on these, on these, um, these patterns. <clears throat> and what happened very early on is that uh, poets started writing poetry to reflect the ragas, and then in turn the painters then started painting paintings uh, to reflect the ragas and also to illustrate the poetry. And sometimes they don't quite illustrate the poetry, so you realize there's all sorts of, it's a very complex uh, sort of, uh, sort of interaction of these three different disciplines. And it's, it's it, but it creates some lots of, lots and lots of painting through most of northern India and even has some, there's some evidence of it in the south, particularly in Mysore. <clears throat> this again is an early painting from this, it's from central India which sort of is fighting any sort of, uh, a lot of the, the naturalistic approaches that have been take place in, in, in many parts of Rajasthan where the, where the, the kings are, are very actively involved with the Mughals. I mean, they're marrying their princess daughters off to the Mughals and they're in the army, they bring their artists with them on the army. So there's all this interaction of styles that happens uh, very rapidly uh, starting in the, uh, the late 16th century. But here, uh, the painting on the left is in the show, the painting on the right is in San Diego, it's from the same set. It's, it's actually a highly prized set. Most of them are not in terrifically great shape and I don't know whether it's how the, the artists actually, whether the, the pigments they were using didn't hold up as well as some others, uh, whether they weren't burnished as much as others, I've never figured that one out. But for my money, these are, are, are sort of the, some of the best paintings done in India. And, uh, my other half just thinks a third grader could do them, but then, you know, we all look at things differently. Uh, but the, the, um, <clears throat> The raga uh, on the left is known as Todi. She's, she's oh, virtually always described as playing a veena, which is what this instrument is with two gourds on each end. It's actually a, a specific type of veena. And she's usually, when she plays, it's to the delight of, of the deer. And so the deer have come. And it's, it's wonderful that the artist has decided that, and it's not just deer that love her music, uh, this, you know, tiger, uh, or a leopard or whatever has come, and so has a peacock, and various birds are flying down. And, and it's obviously also, you know, the, the, this, this cat is certainly not going after the deer. I mean, he's just too enraptured with this music. And, and there's a lot of this sort of, 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 of iconography that shows up in Ragmala painting. You don't, you don't actually see these animals eating each other, <laughs> whereas you do in many other Indian paintings, of course. And another um, raga in the, uh, in the, in the show is, is, is Meg, uh, uh, Meg raga. <clears throat> and Mega actually means cloud. And, and the, um, <clears throat> it's usually depicted, and ragas are male, by the way. I should have said that. And raganis are their wives. And <clears throat> so normally, a normal set has six raga males, and each of them have five wives. So you have 36 paintings in a, in a series. Or, 36 poems in a, in a set. <clears throat> and many of, the, uh, of them, the ragas and the raganis, have to do with either times of day or seasons or that sort of thing. So in this case, it's obviously the reason Meg Raga is almost always seen in a storm. Um, but, and what's curious is there's one called Vasant, and Vasant actually means spring. And springs are also, are often look very much like Mega because it's, it's because in the spring it rains a great deal. And, and rain is something you want because this is a time of love, it's a time of all of this, it's actually it's all of a sudden it cools things down and we just sort of wait for the weather to cool down. But uh, we can do it in painting. And uh, one of the, f uh, there are just a few of the paintings that are, don't come from North India. This painting on the, on the right is actually um, <clears throat> from the south, we, we call it the Deccan. It's a, it's a plateau that's basically the whole heart of the central part of India. Um, <clears throat> and it's, a, it's from a Hyderabad, which was um, a Muslim 
center from very early on. And um, <clears throat> after the Mughals then conquered them, uh, Mughal styles, which are much more naturalistic than other things that were there before, have come in. And this is uh, it, um, <clears throat> an example from, you know, what, what, 1720, is that what I gave, 1760, something like that. Um, <clears throat> they're very, uh, and the one on the left is from the same set, actually. It, this one lives in San Francisco. Um, the architecture is, is, is very similar to in, in all sorts of paintings from this style. And it's quite different from some, some other things. We'll see one in just a bit. But here, another painting from this set that's now in San Diego. But we can compare it to uh, this painting, which was actually the first painting that John Yon bought, um, which is in the show. Uh, again, uh, 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 Rogany. Um, and you, right away, I think you can see how different the treatment of architecture is. And, and one thing that, that people sometimes are uh, off-putting about Indian painting is they'll say, oh, well, there's no depth, or it, the architecture doesn't make sense. Uh, in the case on the left, uh, the, there's very little depth. But in, at the same time, it makes some sense, except for the fact that the architecture is seen from the side, the rugs are seen from the top, the lake is seen from the top. So you have all sorts of different, different ways of looking at, at, uh, um, look, at looking at things from all sorts of different angles. On the right, it's a tiny bit more consistent, but at the same time, you can see that it's not consistent at all. Um, the uh, architecture has been set up so that there's more depth and things are tilted and uh, the fountain is tilted, the, the parterres of the garden are sort of go in every possible direction in a way. Um, and what's, what's, what's uh, found very much in the style in the, in the Deccan in Hyderabad is uh, you'll then notice that the sky makes less sense than the painting does because it's, a, it's very much based on a Persian style uh, with, with gold clouds, gold and orange clouds, uh, far more less naturalistic looking than, than other aspects of the painting. Now what's curious about the, the, this Dana Sri Ragini on the left is that the, the poetry actually has to do with, with a, a, the Ragini's lover is gone and she's limbing a portrait of her lover. Um, this is what the poetry virtually always says. But in this case, she's actually painting herself. And she's, it's, it's a, I mean, that's the way I'm reading it. Um, because it's, um, but it's, I mean, it's an interesting painting. And it's when you see the, oh, we won't see the details yet. We'll be seeing a detail of, of her in just a little bit. <coughs> But I think if the one thing I hadn't noted, mentioned is that virtually all of these paintings use gold. Um, and you will even find drawings, Indian drawings, that, that they look very unfinished, but they're finished. I mean, because there would be gold elements and stuff. And there's a, there's a fine line between drawing and painting. And in this case, I mean, there's lots of gold being, being used. One of the few narrative well, the only well, there are two narrative paintings, I guess, um, that are not have to do with Krishna anyway. <clears throat> it's actually, it's, it's an interesting painting, and uh, it's mostly interesting. I mean, look at that architecture. You tell me how to, how to read it. Um, I'm comparing it actually to a painting of a story, a very similar story. We don't, we're not quite sure what this story is. We know that there's a lot of stories about um, women who take lovers um, and try to, to deceive their husbands. Um, and, the, um, and in most of these stories, they're ultimately based on, on some Hindu old, old fables uh, that were uh, even influenced people like Aesop and stuff. Um, and they virtually always have minas and parrots. And the reason they have minas and parrots is because minas and parrots talk. Um, and, but the minas and parrots tell tales, too. So, so in this case, she's obviously, the lady there, there's, you can see the cage where the mina was, but you see the poor 
Mina with severed head at the bottom. So he's obviously told her something she didn't want to hear. Uh, but the one thing he obviously didn't tell her is that when your lover arrives and he starts climbing the ladder, your husband has been warned by the parrot. <laughs> and the husband has come and, and will kill the lover. And uh, some of the stories he then will kill his wife and other stories he doesn't. But in the story on the, on the, uh, the right, this, a similar thing is happening. The, the lady, this is from the, um, uh, the Tutti Nama. This is an important manuscript, uh, early Moho manuscript that now lives in Cleveland. Uh, and in this case, the, um, the woman, again, uh, has been upset with her mina bird, and she's, uh, the Zamina is at, at her feet, and she's killed it. Now, there, uh, there are just a the, the couple of paintings that have to do with portraiture. Now, one would look at a painting like this and say, well, nobody <coughs> looks like that. Um, and one of the, the things that, that you'll find when you start comparing uh, paintings of women and paintings of men in India, the men are often far more realistic looking. One of the reasons is that the artists could get a hold, I mean, they could actually look at them. Um, and um, <clears throat> in this case, we have these very elegant ladies out for a ride with their, uh, the dog is chasing rabbits. Um, and this is, um, I mean, it's a really striking painting. I, it's, one, it's probably the one I would steal from the show, but I'm not going to steal anything from the show. But if you look at, at, at these faces, again, the, you, you might think that all these Indian ladies look alike, and they don't. Uh, and now you can see the, the lady painting an, another lady. It's very elegant. Then all of that gold and the detail and the architecture, I mean, these, you know, a lot of these paintings took a lot of effort. But you have these three different regions. Um, the one on the bottom is Jodhpur, which is way out in the desert in Rajasthan, uh, from the hills, the Punjab hills, um, and then from Hyderabad in, in the south, and um, from, I believe, from Kishangar in, um, <clears throat> in Rajasthan, although her eye, her eye isn't quite as Kishanguri as they can get. Um, it's, I, there's a lot of paintings that use this really precise detail from that center. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is that these two paintings in the show are actually from the same place, um, probably both executed at Jodhpur. Um, but the one on the left is, dates from around 1720, the one on the right from 100 years later. And I mostly brought it in, uh, put them side by side so you can see the horse doesn't change very much. But if you, you know, obviously look at their faces, you realize the man is very particularly depicted. And um, it, there are lots of these equestrian portraits from this center. This is a painting that's uh, going to be in the uh, show in, <clears throat> in Berkeley. It's the, the only painting in the show that's sort of a wreck. But um, I have it in the show because it gives you some sense of how these paintings were painted. I mean, here we have the Takur, which is a type of noble title, on a horseback. Um, and he's in the horse, and he are, are virtually finished, whereas his little scythe, his little uh, fellow who takes care of the horse and is walking on the side, it has just been sketched out. And the reason this probably has happened is because they were going to be using a whole different group of pigments for, for the scythe. He was probably going to have darker skin. Uh, he was going to be wearing different colors. And, um, and you find a lot of paintings that are unfinished, but they, again, they, for my money, they underscore this whole the quality of the line. And, and um, I'm really big into drawings. I love drawings. The other portrait in the show is far more ambitious um, of, of Bhim Singh. Um, from, he's the Maharana of, of Mewar, who, so he's the ruler in Udaipur. And there are dozens and dozens of paintings very similar to this of, of, of Bhim Singh on horseback. Uh, that big thing, black thing with the solar disk in the center is actually a symbol of the house of Mewar. Um, and uh, very often he has this a Saluki dog will be in the painting, and a whole series of 
courtiers with him and servants, uh, one holding a, a hookah so that, you know, you think they could make a little shelf or something on the horse and not have someone try to keep track, you know, every time if the horse wants to trot, the little guy has to trot. But they're very, very, there's lots of these paintings. This one was recently sold by a dealer in San Francisco. Um, and very similar. Uh, Mary Beth was asking about, are they going out for a hunt? And actually the figure on the right might be going out for a hunt because uh, once the Mughals set up a tradition to always wear green when they go hunting, uh, very often when you see characters in green, you know they're, of course, if they have a flintlock in their hands, and it's a little more obvious that they're going, going hunting. <clears throat> but if you compare the two faces, it's very clear that the artists are drawing real people. And for Beam Singh, I mean, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of paintings of Beam Singh. And he has a very distinct profile. Um, on, in the case of this, this Takur from, from Jodhpur, uh, I haven't really, I haven't been able to trace him down. Uh, he is, I mean, he's labeled with a name, is it Chatur Singh, something like that. Um, but it's quite obvious that this is, the artist is painting a, a real person in this case. Now the last painting in the show is a very ambitious work. It's from a series um, telling the tale of, from the Mahabharata. I don't know if you know, the Mahabharata has to do with this great war between cousins, actually, the Pandava brothers, the five Pandava brothers, and their hundred uh, cousins, the Kurus, the Kauravas. <clears throat> And what's curious is that I've found a, a whole series of paintings that have to do with this very specific moment, which now I can't remember which day it is. Is it the 11th day or the 18th day of the war? Um, I've found uh, like six paintings that have to do with this, this particular scene. And it has to do with, with um, I always forget his name. I just need my glasses. When I met Mary Beth, I didn't need glasses. Uh, yeah, Abhi Manu, who is actually w one of the Arjun, one of the Pandava brothers' son. So you see him in, the, in his chariot, and what has happened is he's gone in towards the bad guys, the, the Kurus. His, they're, I mean, they're cousins and they're other people that are in league with cousins, and of course the Pandavas have other people, including Krishna, in league with them. And he's gone in, and what's happened is, is they've, they've closed ranks behind him. And so you have, the, you have his, his father and his uncles all sort of left out of the fight. And then the fight goes on for, for you know, all day. And um, I'll just, I brought in, oh, first faces. Um, <clears throat> again, a very distinctive face in this style from the Punjab Hills. Uh, very different from uh, here, that's from the same place. But these, these characters tend to be rougher and looking because obviously Krishna is going to be a lot prettier than, than these other figures. I should have put this slide somewhere else. But this is a painting, uh, one of two paintings from this same series uh, of this event in, in San Francisco. Um, the other one in San Francisco is it's just before they close ranks. Um, there's, uh, and then a, a third um, that's in, uh, in uh, San Diego. Uh, again, from this same, this same fight. And you know, when you see the paintings, they're really quite large. And you know, there are dozens and dozens of people and dozens and dozens of horses. <clears throat> and the thing is, when you, go, when you look at Indian painting, what you should do is look at details. There's tons going on. And even in the really small ones, there's uh, a million uh, details to look at. Um, but on the whole, if you look at catalogs of uh, especially private collections, um, the quality that you're getting to see here is top rate. And I think you're lucky. So, whatever, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there any questions? Texts that are in, are they, they 
they are. And in, in like in the Ragmala painting, very often you have the text showing the only one was the Todi, the woman with the deer. That text is very specific and it's translated in the gallery. <clears throat> and then the ones for the, these love, love, love poetry, the texts are right there and we also have translations in the gallery. Um, so the people who are seeing these are primarily <laughs> oh, that's the thing that I didn't uh, mention and we, it's mentioned in the, in the introduction in the gallery. These paintings are, are, they're not meant to be seen in a gallery. Um, yeah, yeah. They're supposed to be held and they're seen in either by you, by yourself, or, or maybe a few other people. Um, obviously, you can't all be looking over each other's shoulders. And, um, and there's actually, there's a long tradition of connoisseurship of, of people, you know, appreciating, appreciating line, appreciating color, um, a color will, it often has to do, will set up moods. Uh, the use of red backgrounds and bowers is always, it's just indicative of a love tryst. Um, and so they're either empty or they're full. <laughs> and, um, and that has to do with, again, the, the poetry is, for my money, I, and I've worked with a lot of it and tried to translate a good deal of it, um, it's, it's sort of love in absence is probably the primary sort of, of, of drive of this, this stuff. Were the artists responsible for the text or were there... No, there's someone else who did the text. And then if you went for... Uh, I mean, none of this is... For, besides the Kalakachara Kata, which is a loose-leaf manuscript, um, None of these were actually, you know, parts of books, except perhaps this guy killing this, his wife's lover. Uh, but that, I mean, I actually, I spread it on the listserv for, you know, there's Indian art historians all over the world, look on this listserv, and no one came up with the story. I mean, they came up with, they said, well, it's sort of like the Tutinama. Well, I knew that, you know, it's, <laughs> we wanted an actual, actual story. Uh, Style points, I guess. The red borders are on some of the Was that a standard for uh, Yeah, red is the, uh, the most common, but you'll find other colors. And actually, in, in some Radmala sets, the different, the different families will have different color borders. Um, it's really remarkable shape, though, as far as the Well, yeah, it's a lock type paintings. Sort of red. Yeah, there's been some work done. There's a catalog I had done of a private collection in San Francisco where she wanted a text on, you know, uh, paints and all of that. And it's, it's, there's a lot written on it. It's, it's pretty interesting. You know, it's all mineral, mineral, and vegetable and mineral stuff. But then in the 19th century, um, all of a sudden, some European colors are coming in. And it, it can just ruin a style, like, within weeks, it seems to me. <laughs> were these books produced for particular individuals, or...? Well, they mostly, they were, mostly they were done for, you know, rich landlords or, or royalty. Um, and many of them were actually, appear to have been commissioned by women in the harems. And, and, and uh, there are some studies that would suggest that much of the erotic iconography um, and erotic paintings were actually done for, I guess, they were lonely in the harem or whatever. <laughs> my, my other style point would be about the portions of my notes, the uh, ones that are facing to the right, all have their right foot, right front foot, uplifted, and then left front, thrust forward. Is that a standard? I don't know. I would have to think about it. I mean, we can uh, get back to him. Looking at horses facing the other way. <laughs> so sort of the hoof facing you would be <laughs> facing the viewer. And the one thing I didn't mention, this is something that happens in Indian painting a lot. Well, it happens on both these paintings, is that the frame isn't necessarily a frame. Very often, elements will extend. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, the hoof extends and the tail. And here the leg is, see, this is a, it's a wreck of a painting, but you know, it was really, the frame is, is here. So there's this, all this. Not to my knowledge, I haven't seen it. Oh, I know. And then it has to do with whether someone's died in battle and all of this stuff. Yes, I just heard stories about it was just in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, and they were talking about this one statue was wrong. <laughs> yes. Most of the writing is in Debenon Greek script. Yes. But there was one that looked like it had um, Arabic script. And I wondered what. Well, I mean, one finds uh, one finds Persian script a lot, Nasalik a lot, in even in Rajasthan, in, in on Hindu paintings. I don't remember seeing any Nasalik or Nashkan. But then the the Devanagari is used on most of them, but. Uh, in the Pahari Hills, they, they very often use Takri, which is a different script. It's actually based on Gurmukhi. Um, and, you know, the, and if we had a, a more styles, and, you know, especially if they were text pages from actual <laughs> books, we could have, you know, dozens of scripts. Yeah. Any? Yes. Well, they can, but the thing is that Indian painting is pretty hardy, um, and they can take sunlight. Um, I mean, it's certainly not like Japanese prints or something that, you know. Uh, museums are over, often very overly cautious with Indian painting. Um, and, you know, they'll have their only can be out for so long, and they have to sleep for five years or whatever. And um, it's it's a it's, and when you're trying to curate a show and you have this key painting that you just need and the registrar is, you have to fight with the registrar to get it up for two weeks. I mean, it's just, but the thing is that the way the painting is, the paint is applied, it, it's, paint, it's applied in layers and then the, 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 the painting when it's dry, the, the painting is then put down flat and then you burnish it from the back and so it compacts the, the pigment um, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's opaque watercolor is what we call it. Sometimes they call it gouache, but it's not quite Western gouache. So opaque watercolor sort of works a little bit better. But it's, it's, you know, it's handled very different from when we think of watercolor, we think of, you know, light washes. And what's curious is that when the British arrive, um, Indian artists take to the water, I mean, a proper European watercolor technique very quickly, and they get very adept at it for for you know, for Eng for English and French painters. What type of paper they use? Okay. They never paint on silk or any material. You know, they paint on uh, usually it's, it's handmade paper. Uh, often it's often built up in layers. It's almost like a board, but they do paint on cloth. Now they paint on cloth in two different ways, depending on where you are. And one will be actually basically dyeing the cloth. But most of the, all in North India, they're actually paint on cloth just like they paint on paper. So they need a really thick buildup. And um, it's a problem. But often they use cloth when they want something, you know, big enough that they can't make a piece of paper. And, but there are some very large cloth paintings that are, are done. But it's all built up the this, this same way. Well, thank you.